Wait, are we going to get these videos or anything? I'm, I'm putting them online. Okay. You can watch this later. Online where? You'll see it. I'll post it on Facebook. I'll, I'll, I'll tag you as in the video. Huh? Oh, did you already start? You're wasting feel what? <laughs> I was going to ask you how, how strict <coughs> things are in terms of like, I guess talking about Christianity. I guess little Virginia is very, uh, I don't know if it's paranoid, if she's being very cautious about it for like chatting, emails, even Skyping. Um, yeah, she's very if, cautious if, about if, it. If it's electronic, you basically just don't want to do it. Okay. <clears throat> so I'm trying to avoid as much as possible. Um, and also, and, I mean, here's, here's the tip. Uh, I have Melissa tell me it's like it's not that bad, especially in Shanghai, because international people. But I don't know. No, it's, it's, it's not. It's not a big deal until it is a big deal, because, right? Yeah. It's not. It's not a big deal until you get arrested and they pull up your phone records and they pull up your email records, right? right? Then it's a big deal. But if you if you never get caught, yeah, it's not a big deal. No one's ever gonna know, right? But but it's that one time where you do get caught, right? Where also becomes a huge deal because it's not just you yourself. It's everyone you emailed, right? Yeah. Does that make sense? Right, if I'm trying to catch a crook, what do I do? Check the email records and everything they contacted, right? And then, and then I, ma I match up when they contact each other and then what I think their professions are too. You know what I'm saying? That's why it's a big deal. I see. Look, the worst thing that can happen to you is you get deported. The worst happens to them, they get thrown in prison, right? They can get executed, you know, like they can. Right? The mayor of Shanghai was executed a few years ago. Really? Yeah, for corruption. Him and his entire cabinet got executed. It's not a joke, man. America is like this fake land, okay? The rest of the world is not freaking joking around. What up? Since I'm a U.S. citizen now, I could just get deported, right? Not get executed. Wait, do you hold dual citizenship? No. Okay, you're fine. Okay, ready? Yeah, it sucks for you. Okay. No. She will get executed. This is what I was curious about. What's executed? Don't worry about that. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. Let's go! Yeah. <laughs> Everyone. You teach. <laughs> All right, let's go. Let's I got. Go. Okay, I'm trying. I'm trying. I'm trying to say a signal for my my camera so I know right. when I can edit. You sure it's not shooting? No, it's head. It's above. Flip that. Flip the LCD around so I can see myself. No, we're good. See George, that? George's head. George. <laughs> okay. I'm gonna come out of the ground so I can. I know when to edit. <laughs> Welcome everybody to Missions Training at Harvest. Snow, what are you doing? <laughs> Sorry, I took it. Oh my gosh. <laughs> this is the worst day of my life. Uh, this is the worst day of my life. It's on tape now too. <laughs> Can we just keep the rock video? No. Hate it is more than words. You have it good, George. See, 150 for you is 10%. 150 for me is, is 5%. Not, not even 5%. I think it's like 4%. Your friends are older, okay? So you actually have easier. My friends are a little older, so I have to 150 for me is 50%. I guess so. Wait, 100%. Everyone, stop. We're done with this conversation. Like ready? Hey, you ready? 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 <laughs> Welcome, everybody, <laughs> to Mission Training at Harvest. Today, we will be talking about Hudson Taylor. Alright? <laughs> Hudson Taylor. I think if you're if you're if you went to church in China, Snow should know. He's famous. He's a famous missionary to China, Hudson Taylor. I don't know what his Chinese name is. What is his Chinese name? Hudson no Taylor. No. Hudson. Yeah, yeah, something like that. Okay, but <clears throat> we're gonna learn about mission mission history because you guys need role models, all right? And because I'm too young to be a role model, <laughs> I'm gonna show. Virginia is way too young to be a role model. Uh, I'm gonna show you guys stuff from history. So. Hudson Taylor, he's famous because he's one of the founders of the... I spelled founders wrong. Founders. <laughs> founders of the what movement? Did I guess? Probably can't guess. Oh wait, trip the... No. Nope. Faith no. missions. Oh. Okay, I'm gonna explain, explain what that is. What is the difference between faith missions and not faith missions? <laughs> Alright, because shouldn't all missionaries have faith? Mm. Before, before Hudson Taylor, um, all missionaries were pretty much sent out by their churches or denomination boards. An example, we, we still have non-faith missions, and this is not, it's not like they're not, they don't have faith, all right? It's just the name of the movement. So the Southern Baptists today, they're not a faith mission. The, the, because the way the Southern Baptist Convention works is that every church in the, in the SBC, you give money to the mission fund, right? And then because they have, they have money in the mission fund, they hire missionaries as employees, just like we would hire a pastor. And pa the pastor doesn't really support, obviously. He just goes to work, and he gets a paycheck every month. Southern Baptist missionaries do the same thing. Because they get money from the, from the missions fund. Once you get hired as a missionary for a Southern Baptist, 
then you just get paid. You don't have to raise support. So re Hudson Taylor first started out as one of those. He started out as one of the, one of uh, London evangel evangelical so evangelization society's missionaries. But then when he got to China, he realized that it wasn't it didn't work out very well. Part of the reason was is because um, those those missionary societies in early England they would go into debt. Right? They they actually would go into debt, and sometimes so sometimes their funds wouldn't come in. And so when the funds didn't come in, Hudson Taylor wouldn't get paid. Wouldn't get paid. So there were there were like months in Shanghai when he was in in China where he wouldn't get paid. So he still had to pay rent, he still had to get food, he still had to get all that stuff, but he wouldn't get a paycheck, right? And so it was really erratic and it was really really hard on his life. And these fellows like it was really disorganized. And so um, when after his first term in China, he came back to to England and decided to look, we're going to do faith missions, right? Faith missions believe in that. If you can write this down, God's work done in God's way will never lack God's supply. God's work done in God's way will never lack God's supply. And it's this idea of that if God has called you to be a missionary, God will always, always provide for the work. right? And that a missionary society doesn't have to go into debt. Because God will never put his workers in, into debt. right? Because God is never in debt to anybody. So the whole idea of faith missions basically then is this. There is no cap of how many employees we can have. Okay, If you have a denominational board, obviously you do have a cap. It's once that money runs out, then you can't hire more missionaries. But Hudson Taylor's philosophy basically is then, and then is this. If you're, called the, if you're called a missionary, we'll take you. Raise your own support. And then that, that would also validate the fact that you know, you're called to called be a missionary. Okay? Um, that's pretty much what we do at Harvest now, too, right? Harvest will give you a third, but you have to raise the other, other two-thirds of what you, of what you need to, to get there. Basically, you believe in that if God has called you there, he'll help you to raise the support to get there. I mean... I obviously, I work for OMF, which is founded by Hudson Taylor. I've raised support now for three years. You know, and because I believe God's called me to do this job, and so now I do this. So <clears throat> the whole idea of faith missions is what helped missions really, really expand and grow in the 1800s. It's because before then, you had a cap on how many, how many missionaries you can have. Because pretty much, if people didn't give to the mission fund, then you couldn't have missionaries. But with faith missions, all of a sudden, it's like, if you feel called to be a missionary, do it. We'll take you, as long as you raise, raise your support. Right, so it's having faith that God is, is bringing this missions movement. So this is important because some personal values Hudson Taylor held for himself. <clears throat> One of them, we already said it, is faith. All right, let me tell you a story about Hudson Taylor, an example of that. Um, One of the ways he practiced faith before he even went to China is that he was a doctor in in London. One of the things he wanted to do when he, when he was young is that he wanted to trust God in London because he knew it would be harder to trust God in China, obviously, because it's a foreign country. And so when he, when he worked as a doctor, um, he, his employer was very forgetful. Like, he wouldn't, sometimes he wouldn't get paid on time. And so um, he made it a point that he would trust God to remind his employer to pay him on time. And he would never, he would never remind his, um, his boss himself. So he, tell, he tells us one story of where... He, 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 went, he went to work, and he knew the rent was getting, you know, he had to pay the rent that day, and his landlady, like, needed the rent. But then he went, he went to work that day, he's like, man, I hope my boss pays me today, because sometimes he forgets. And then the day, the day ended, his boss looked at him and said, okay, I'll see you on Monday, <laughs> right? And then he went home, he was like, dang it, I, think, I didn't get paid, right? But then instead of reminding his boss, he just prayed and prayed and prayed. And then that night, you know, his boss comes by and says, Hey, you know what? I just had a patient come after we closed, and he paid me in cash. I think I owe you a paycheck, right? And his boss would just pay him in cash there, and he would pay his rent that day. But he has tons of stories like that, where he just trusted that God would put it on people's hearts, right, to provide for his needs, and that he wouldn't have to express those needs himself. And so <clears throat> one of his fundamental values he held was faith, believing that God would continue to take care of him, that God would continue to clear the path before him. And so the way, even the way he did in China, you know, express that belief, all right, faith. Holiness is the second value. <clears throat> the reality is not, not every missionary is super holy and super worth imitating. Um, if you know the history of China, right, and especially with China and England, you know, you would know that, you guys know about the, the treaty ports and like the opium wars? Mm -hmm. Okay, everyone knows the opium war. Okay, so, if, if, you, if you think about, if you're an English person, how do you view China if you just destroy them in a war and you basically open up their ports as, as parts of the treaty, the end of the war, 
Right, you're basically looking at something as kind of an inferior country. All right, we do we can do that in the U.S. too. It's kind of like how the U.S. treats Mexico and Canada. Right, what, it's not it's not as bad. It's not as bad, but it's like Mexico more than Canada. Yeah, Mexico more than Canada, but like in a lot of ways, like you kind of abuse your relationship a little bit. Right, but but England, like the attitude toward Chinese was very like we're better than you, and so missionaries group in that culture too. Right, just because you're a missionary doesn't mean you're devoted to the culture. So even when missionaries went to China, they would live in their own missionary compounds, which were a lot bigger than um, like average Chinese places. If you go to, if, when you go to Shanghai this, this summer, you guys will see some of the, some of the European built areas look a lot better and they're, st they're, they're still up, right? Because they're historic landmarks because they're so nicely built. And a lot of the Chinese built stuff is like gone. It's like demolished. And then they put like, you know, apartments and stuff above it now. But when Hudson Taylor got to Shanghai, he realized that a lot of the missionaries were basically like trying to live above the Chinese. And they're, they're basically like really lazy and self-indulgent. Right, because they have not a lot of supervision, and then, you know, it was nice living. Uh, Hudson Taylor said, there was nowhere else in the world where missionaries get treated as nicely as in Shanghai. Which, which kind of makes sense, because the missionaries, some of them worked closely with the British government, and it was very political, you know, so they got a lot of favors. So what Hudson Taylor, what Hudson Taylor was known for is also his holiness, that he separated himself out from things that were just super indulgent, right, that were just selfish, that were kind of self-exalting, things that would just build himself up, right? Holiness is the idea is that you set yourself apart from God. And that's what Hudson Taylor did. Everything in his life, he set himself apart for God. A story of that, <clears throat> when he was still in England, you know, he was like you know, 17, 18 years old. And what do 17, 18 year olds do? They find girls. And so <laughs> he was introduced to, to this woman that he was actually um, engaged to twice. And he broke off the engagement twice. Because um, the, the woman he was engaged to had no interest in, in China. And she thought that it was just a kind of a passing idea, like some like boy's dream for Hudson Taylor. Right? But obviously it wasn't for Hudson Taylor. But I, and he, really, he really loved her and he really wanted to be with her. And they were engaged twice. They got together, realized it couldn't work, broke it off, and then got together again, and then broke it off. But then he did that because he realized that his passion was to serve God and not just to get married. Right? So that's characteristic of his life. Read that for me. No. Contextualization. Contextualization. Context. The, the, the two words is context, visualization. That idea is <clears throat> making, making something make sense in, in context. Right? If, if, if I say to you, pass me the ball. Right? And George looks at me and like he like throws me basketball. Right? I'm like, no, I want a football. He's like, how am I supposed to know that? Right? Because out of context, things don't make sense. Right? Or if I say, pass me the rock. Right? You throw me a rock. I'm like, no, I wanted the basketball. Right? You're like, what? Right? You never, you never say, pass me the rock. Okay, it's a basketball term. So people say it. Okay? People say it. Pass me the rock. Shaving. <laughs> but, or shaving. I made that up. But anyway, no, I didn't make that up. People say it. <laughs> Anyways, contextualization. One of the problems a lot of early missionaries struggle with is making the gospel make sense, making church make sense in another culture. I saw this crazy picture of uh, these, you know, Victorian 1800 missionaries in Africa, and they're wearing their, like, you know, in English, like, wool, like, suits, right? And they're playing an organ. And across from them are Africans who are pretty much all naked, right? And they're sitting in the dirt, right, with, like, their spear and shield, and they're, like, singing hymns, right? And I was like, that is an example of not contextualizing, <laughs> Okay. Being in Africa, wearing wool suits, playing an organ, and singing hymns. And that's what a lot of missionaries did. They're like, well, if we do it in England, we'll do it in China, right? We'll sing in English, and we'll sing, we'll sing, with, we'll sing with organs, and then you have to dress, dress in wool, you know? Like, that, to them it makes sense. But one of the things Hudson Taylor did is like, you know what? If I'm going to reach the Chinese, I have to be like the Chinese. So one of, one of the things that he's famous for is... is Chinese dress and manners. So what Hudson Taylor did in, in an age where this is really scandalous is that he actually, um, you know the old, you know, the old 1800s Chinese, they had like the 
shave the front side of their head and have a pigtail mm -hmm. right down the back. Right? You know what I'm talking about, right? You know the so young. The no, I do know. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. Like, like, small small ponytail. Yeah, the, the, the ponytail, right? Um, obviously, that's not English style. It's not Chinese style, obviously, right? Um, but if you imagine you're Hudson Taylor and you're walking through Shanghai, it's obvious you're white. Because you're wearing, like, you, you, the way you dress, like these heavy coats and stuff like that, the way you have your hair, right? It's obviously very white. And you realize that when he was doing that, the Chinese wouldn't see him as Chinese. He would see him as a, as a white person, like, hey, what are, you gonna do? what are you doing here? I want money or I want food, right? Um, and he realized that, that was really impacting his ministry. He couldn't, he couldn't share the gospel like that. So what he did was he cut, he cut off the front side of his hair, he did a ponytail, and he started dressing like a Chinese. All right? And after he did that, some people couldn't even tell him he was white. Right. You can get, and ch Chinese like the, the ch Chinese look is actually very varied. So I I can believe that. Like some Chinese people look like all kinds of different looks. And so when he noticed when he did that was that the Chinese started listening to what he had to say, because they didn't see him as a white person anymore. They saw him as a Chinese person, you know, who was respectable and had something to teach. So I put infamous because the other missionaries hated it. The other missionaries are like, what are you doing? This is like so disrespect disrespectful, right? It's like it's like basically like. If I, if, yeah, if I should have a harvest without a shirt on, I just wear like board shorts. Right? Yeah. You've done it. <laughs> right? But, people, but like the old Chinese people here would be like, what the heck is he doing? Why does he, why does he have no shirt on? Right? And I'm like, we're going to go surfing later, dude. You know? And they're like, what? That, but that's pretty much the equivalent of what it looked like. Right? So the, 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 to them, they're like, dude, you're so disrespectful. Right? You're supposed to be a missionary. How come you're like dressed on the Chinese? But to the Chinese, it made sense. The Chinese is like, wow, you're actually respecting our culture. Right? Because a lot of British people didn't respect Chinese culture. They're like, well, we beat you in the opium war, and so we get to own you. All right? That's basically the attitude. We get to own you. We beat you in the opium war. But Hudson Taylor took on Chinese dress and manners to respect the Chinese. All right? To validate their culture and become one of them. That's one of the things Jesus did. Did Jesus come with, like, angel wings, right? And, like, his full glory with, like, a host of angels behind him? He came as a carpenter, and he was ugly. <laughs> okay, and he was probably dirty most of his life, and he was poor. Foxes have holes, birds have nests, but Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. I mean, Jesus was homeless. All right, he didn't have to be that way. Jesus could have done anything he wanted to, but he chose the, that life to be like one of us. So that's one of the things Hudson Taylor did, too. <clears throat> and then the last one, Hudson Taylor's legacy for today. The mission society that Hudson Taylor founded was called CIM. All right, C CIM stands for China Inland Mission, because um, though he started out in Shanghai, he didn't stay in Shanghai. He realized that there were actually a lot of missionaries in Shanghai, and that the parts that were not reached were the inland of China. And so, when he went back um, to England to recruit other missionaries, he recruited two missionaries for each province. All right, because at that time there were, there were twelve provinces in China. Um, and then from those initial group of 24 missionaries, he founded the China Inland Mission. But in the late 1940s, you guys know about World War II and communism, all the missions got kicked out of China. So CIM could no longer be CIM, obviously, <laughs> right? And so one of the things that they decided, like, look, do we then stop being a missionary agency, or do we change what we do? CIM decided that they're, they're going to change, and CIM later became ONF which stands for Overseas Missionary Fellowship. From After 1940, o OMF was founded to not just reach China, but all of East Asia, right? East Asia basically comprises of, like, Thailand, Vietnam. We don't go as low as India. We don't go as high as, as Russia. So pretty much the East Asian sector. At one point in, um, at one point under CIM, one, one out of every four missionaries were CIM missionaries, right? That's how, that's how big CIM was at one point. All right, one out of every four missionaries going overseas were CIM. And then, what's up? Was CIM like worldwide or like English or like American? So, so CIM, their missionaries were all over, like from the Western world. So from, there were missionaries from Canada, Australia, England, like France, and all of them. Yeah. So they had to travel by boat, right? By boat, yeah. Oh. So it was like months and months journey. Yeah, it was hard times back then. Okay. Applications from what I just taught, okay? Um, and why I bring up Hudson Taylor. Hopefully, there's some things you can, you can learn from his life, right? 
Number one of the idea of faith missions. Now you guys know why you raise support. We can do this a lot of ways, right? We can we can we can do this a lot of ways. I know a lot of you have have parents or whatever, or you know ways of making money that you can make your own money and just go China yourself. You can't, right? I when I first started, I'm like, look, I, I make tons of money. I can just do this myself. When you do that, though, two things happen. You're not just raising money, but you're also helping the church become invested in missions, right? The things you spend money on, money on, are the things you're invested in, you care about, right? Like I, I don't, I don't like, I lock my car for a reason, because I spend money on my car and I don't want my car to get stolen, <laughs> right? The things I put money in are the things I care about, the things I want to succeed. When people invest in you and your missionary journey, they want to see you succeed because they gave you money, right? It gives them opportunity to be part of your life. That's part of why faith missions exist. That's why I'm not there to ask people for money because it's. There's a chance that I can't really go to church. Okay, but we'll talk, that's your, your own different story. But for you guys, and for Virginia, and for anyone else who wants to be a missionary, that's one of the things I always say, right? Is that you can test for people to invest in what you do. The reason I've been able to do my job for the last three years, I've had to raise like tens and tens of thousands of dollars from college kids and new young adults. All right, and the reason I've been able to do that is because people believe in the ministry that I do. And I, I'm not even over, I'm, I'm here in the U.S., Right? I'm here in the U.S. as a missionary, and they still believe in what I do. Right? It's because they've seen my life over time. Right? And that's, and that's what we're trying to do in faith missions. We're, ha we're sharing our life with people, letting them invest in us. Okay? Personal values. This is something kinda, you got to kind of figure out for yourself. All right? And I hope that you guys will write down, especially you, George. <laughs> write this down. It? Your own personal values. Oh. Okay? Wait, why me? This is for you to grow up as a man. Okay? I am not enough. <laughs> you have to be affirmed. To to grow to grow as a person, you need to have your own personal values of what you believe in and what you stand for, right? And that's how you filter your life through, right? So some some of my personal values, okay. One of my personal values I believe in is building up others, right? I see myself as a trainer. Whether it be missions, whether it be working out, or whether it be basketball, whether it be video games, all right? I see I, I, I my personal value is, if I can go into a situation, make other people better, and if I can be forgotten, I've succeeded. If I go into a situation where I need to be there and no one else is getting better, then I failed. That's a personal value that I hold myself. Okay. Another personal value I hold myself is to be, is to be disciplined. Is that if I believe in something, I'm gonna, I'm gonna sacrifice and to work hard and not have anyone call me lazy for anything in my life. Right. So my personal value is the hard work and discipline. Okay. And then my my third personal value is faith. Believing that if God calls something, that God's going to provide for that thing. Right? But those are my values. You don't, have, you don't have to have those values. But you've got to figure out your own values. Okay? Because those values will carry you throughout your life. And that's how you in interact with God. That's how you figure out what God is calling you to do. Right? Because God has made you a certain way. And so you have to kind of be faithful to the way God has made you, the way God has called you. Okay? Something I'm going to ask you about this week. What are your personal values? Can you just take yours? You can't good. take mine. Are you a trainer? Are you a trainer? Well, the last two. The last two are pretty good. Okay. You know why I have faith? Because I pray for things that have been ridiculous in my life. All right? That's how I know God's calling me to faith. All right? That, that might not be your value. Wait, even you don't so say discipline? Even I'm not disciplined yet, but can I put that as my value? You, like, you can, but you're, you're old enough now. You're old enough now. To be that, disciplined. Yeah. No, no. That you already have some things you're good at. I okay, know you know, you know, I didn't say studying. Okay, I'm not good at studying. <laughs> Me neither. So like, some people are. Carmen's really good at studying. I know. Okay, Car Carmen's really good at administration. That's one of her values, right? Is to be like a support character in the background. That's not my value. I respect hers, but that's not my personal value. It could value. be that you are good at, you are good at something, but you don't treat them as your values. It could be that all oh, my parents. And th and don't this is a, and this is a chance for you to figure out if I want to make them my value. I'm not naturally dis disciplined. It's not like I love, like, man, I really will not want to eat ice cream. I really want to make myself hurt, you know? No. I work at it, you know? Okay. Something you figure out on your own. <clears throat> Infamous, known for... <clears throat> you know, one of the things that, um, as you guys are also writing your support letters and sharing your story, you want to kind of tell people, what are you passionate about? Right? What do you want to be known for? Okay, this is actually this is actually kind of important. This kind of in our in our age of like YouTube and like all that stuff, right? People get known for a lot of stupid things. 
But along with the personal values is what do you want to be known for? Right? Like one of the things I, I'm proud is that when people like talk to me, I haven't seen for a long time, what's the first thing they ask me about? Hey, how's Shanghai? When's the last, when is the last time you go to Shanghai? All right, who are you training for missions? That's what I'll be known for. I do a lot of other things, okay? I am super good at WoW, all right? I play World of Warcraft like crazy, all right? I'm good at bodybuilding, all right? I sing, I dance, I do crazy stuff like that, right? I don't, I don't want to be known for that, right? I want, when people think about Dave Pat, I want them to think about what I do for God's kingdom. That's one of the things that I want, I hope it comes across when you're sharing your support letters and stuff like that, is that what are you trying to grow in? What are you trying to learn? What are you trying to become? Seven years ago, I was not known for Shanghai missions, obviously. I was just starting. But it's something I was passionate about. I kept sharing with people. But here's your chance to kind of be able to share that by yourself. Okay. For Carmen, she's not, she's not known for Shanghai missions, she's, even though she's my wife. Right? But she's kind of known as a very supportive, helpful person. Right? That everything she does in her life, she's always supporting somebody and helping somebody. That's something good to be known for, too. And so even when she writes her mission letters, she writes, I go on this trip to support David, to support my team members, right? To support the house church, to support our church. Because that's who she is. That's one thing she wants to be known for. All right? And with that, if we end this lesson, this will be put on the mightydavepat.com. Also linked on Facebook. Okay, but let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you just for this afternoon. We can just learn from your, um, from the people that you've put throughout history that the people you've given um, your amazing blessings to, that you've led, and that you've called to holiness and to service. God, give us all strength and courage in this room um, to pursue the things that you ha would have us be passionate about, um, to be able to see you in glory, and to follow after you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.